You've described your job as exhausting, frustrating, yet exhilarating, and there's a bit of pressure put on you to be something of a middleman between defense industry and the military. Um, in an ideal world, how would you describe your job description? In an ideal world? In an world. ideal world. Well, we live in a fallen world, I'm afraid, and I have to live within the constraints <laughs> that means for my job. I mean, obviously, one's always trying to reconcile a whole host of competing priorities. Quite rightly, the armed forces want the very best kit they can get uh, immediately. Uh, and indeed, when you're engaged in urgent operation, in operations in Afghanistan and places, there's an absolute obligation to make sure they get what they need for, for, for the campaign. But equally well, financial resources are always limited at even the best of times. Uh, and uh, particularly so at present, of course, when Britain's facing a very large budget deficit. So we live in very far from ideal circumstances. But getting the right kit at the best price we can in good time is the essence of the game. There's a bit of a time scale, obviously. And, and uh, bringing up the defence review, many would say that it's, it's put the UK in a bit of a precarious position. Admittedly, there are a few inconsistencies. We have carrier cuts with cuts in naval air capability on one hand, and we're potentially looking at cuts in the Chinook helicopter fleet, which have been said to be the vital aspect of operations in Afghanistan, uh, maybe just rumor. But out of this, where do we pull out the strategy? What are our priorities in all of this? Oh, it, it, we're very clear. I don't, I don't accept there are any inconsistencies at all. That wouldn't surprise you. Uh, very, two absolute priorities. First, Afghanistan. That is the main effort. That's the one we have been most worried about all the time. Uh, and that's where, obviously, all our, all our attention is concentrated. But also building towards the Future Force 2020, the, the vision we have for the armed forces in a few years' time. And it's true that in the interim period, we are taking some risks against some capabilities. I mean, ideally, we would have kept the, the, the carrier strike capability going for the whole period. But we can't do that. Our judgment is it's a risk we can take in the, in the interim period. We're looking forward to rebuilding it with the very capable Queen Elizabeth-class carriers and, of course, Joint Strike Fighter. Uh, so, so I don't accept that there are inconsistencies. There are tough choices we've had to make, capabilities we've had to take out of, out we would rather not have taken out, but we think we can do safely in the present environment. And it's, it is a particularly tough position to be in. Do you foresee the possibility in the near future that the carrier decision would be reversed? No. It, 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 in fact, it's almost literally irreversible. Um, because the new carriers are, can't be built any sooner, uh, and the old carriers are going out of service. So um, we're very grateful for the kind of support we're getting from our allies to maintain our skills during the interim period. I agree there are challenges for those who will fly off the aircraft, fly off the carriers, fly the aircraft, those who will operate the carriers, but we're confident we can do that with the help of our allies. Uh, and, and, and we're looking forward to rebuilding Carrier Strike around some very capable aircraft, uh, which we're, of course, Britain's a major partner with, uh, with the Americans, uh, and on very capable carriers. We're looking forward to it. But it's... it's, it's uh, it's not going to be revisited. It can't be. Okay. We're looking at around a 1.6 billion pound shortfall in the MOD budget. Is there any chance there might be an official reopening of the SDSR? I don't know where you get your figure from because I haven't got that figure. I think I read it in a newspaper and I've learned one thing in this job, not to believe anything I read in newspapers. Um, um, absolutely anything. Um, no, we're not going to revisit the SDSR. The SDSR sets the strategic direction. We've always made it perfectly clear Actually, it would take more than SDSR on our first planning round, our first financial planning round, to address the problems we've inherited. And it comes as no surprise that our permanent secretary said this to the Public Accounts Committee, the House of Commons, back in December. You know, we are absolutely clear. It's a tough struggle. It's a tough settlement. We'll make it work. We have to. We have to because, as I've often said, there's no point defending a bankrupt nation. And defence must play its part in bringing the very, very large structural deficit we have in this country back under control again. So uh, we'll make it work. It won't happen overnight. We'll have, we have problems to address which will take two or three planning rounds, in my view, to sort out. But we'll get there. We will have a balanced budget. We have to for the sake of the country. So if Afghanistan is a priority, and we're not necessarily having the gap that you mentioned, is the MOD going to be in a position of having to ask the Treasury for more funds? No. Okay. Except, of course, don't forget Afghanistan is funded out of the, um, the reserve for urgent operational requirements. That's over and above the core MOD budget. Okay, so there would be an allowance there. That, that, that's planned for. Estimates are made at the beginning of each year. Okay. Uh, so that money is not out of the core budget. And how much might we expect could be funneled out of that? Well, we will do what's necessary to, to make sure we can sustain the effort in Afghanistan. And we're confident we'll do that.